Hi everybody, Robin Nichols back with another Photoshop Elements tutorial. I'm going to look at Photo Merge Panorama in this version 11. Now, one of the cool things about panorama making is it's become so easy in Photoshop Elements, i.e. the software, the programming is so good, it gets it right almost every time. So, here are a few facts. If you're going to shoot a panorama, you need to have the camera pretty much on a level. I always get people to shoot vertically, as you can see the frame here, because then if we have to crop it top and bottom, the picture doesn't suddenly become a little bit flat. So shoot it vertically, overlap your frames by at least 20%, shoot about three or five frames, depending on whether it's a small or a very wide panorama. You can go wider if you want. Fourth thing is set the camera to manual metering and take an average meter reading from in between the lightest and the darkest part of the scene. Set it as your, as your setting in manual, and that's the one you stick with. To be pedantic, turn the a focusing off as well. So focus on a particular spot. Shoot at maybe f11 or f16 to get a good depth of field. Focus on a particular and spot and then turn it off, because you don't want it auto-focusing on a weed or something in the foreground, because that's going to throw it out as well. And lastly, but not least, change the white balance to custom, and just dial in a correct white balance for daylight or whatever you're shooting at, and do some testing first. So... Before you shoot, I always get people to take a picture of their foot. Then you shoot the segments, then you take another picture of your foot. So months or weeks later, you can think, gee, you know, I did a panorama in the bush there the other week. Where is it? You know, and you've got a hundred zillion other pictures like this. You know, where is the panorama amongst all this lot? You know, it's actually across the top here, but you wouldn't necessarily remember that. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of uh, shooting a picture of your foot or just the camera bag or something that's irrelevant. So you know, oh, OK, that's the start and there's the finish. So I've got all my single images open in the window here. They don't have to be in order. They don't even have to have the same names because the program looks at the features in each picture. Even the trees here, which I'm a little bit dubious about. You can see here the trees are a little bit fantastic. There was a bit of motion in the, in the air that day. So, you know, the trees will be moving. So it'll be kind of interesting to see whether they have, uh, they're going to be able to merge them. Traditionally, I would go to File, New, and choose Photo Merge, and of course, the guys have gone and moved it. It's now under the Enhance menu, down the bottom, across the, to the right, and then we're going to choose the Panorama Merge. Which layout to use? Go for Auto every time, because it is absolutely brilliant. I like to open my pictures first, and then start Photo Merge, so I can just check that I've got the right ones open, and then I click on Add open files. I can of course click the browse button and it's going to go off and find the pictures anyway. And then click OK. So then what I can do is just simply lean back, pat myself on the back for doing a job well done. This program and indeed a couple of the previous programs has a feature called auto content or content aware fill. And what this means is that when it's finished copying, pasting, building masks and aligning the layers, as you can see it's doing now. It may decide that Robin actually moved the camera a little bit down to the right as he was taking his five or seven sections. So it's just going to leave them checkerboard. And checkerboard in Photoshop Elements means there's nothing there. It means it's just spare space. So if you've got a little bit of a checkerboard pattern around some or all of your panorama, it's going to say, look, do you want me to fill it in? And of course you're going to go, well, <laughs> absolutely, get on with it, fill it in you'll find that nine times out of ten it's going to come back and say, look, I tried, but you haven't got enough RAM. And it's ridiculous because I've got 24 gigs of RAM in my computer and it still comes up with this warning sign, so it's kind of annoying. My tip to you is just forget about that. If you know that you want that to happen, reduce the size of your images, each section, by 70%. So, look, I'm working with a Canon EOS 5D Mark II. I get 60.2 megabyte files. So you want to end up with a file that's probably 20 megabytes. Here it's going to say, would you like to automatically fill in the edges of your panorama? I'm going to go, yeah, all right, just to prove to you. So it's now saying, sorry, can't do it. I kind of knew it was going to do that. So I'm going to say, well, I accept that. Let's have a look at the layer palette because this is very interesting. It's built, taken a section and built a little black mask around it. So it's actually, if I just hide all these, that's what it's done here. If I just zoom out. So it's actually chosen that bit on the right hand side and then it's added to that to that, to that, to that, to that, to that. Isn't that amazing? So when you choose that content aware business and it fails, it actually puts them all together in a flattened version up the top. If you don't have that flattened version, it's necessary to shift click all the layers and then you can choose layer flatten image from up above and it says 
in this case, discard the hidden one, which is my one demonstration one at the top, and it'll flatten them all and you'll get a white background. Let me just cancel that at the moment. So flattening them allows me to do this layer, flatten image, so the transparency in the background disappears and you just get a solid image. In this case, I don't really need to keep the layers at all because I need to just get on and crop my image as accurately as possible, something like that. Okay, and I'm going to think of the rule of thirds here, folks. So remember, if we've got this fantastic rule of thirds thing here. So I'm thinking there's a third sky. So maybe I could even bring that down a little bit more. So just to, you know, so nobody ticks me off and says, look, Robin, you're not doing rule of thirds anymore. There's the rule of thirds. And I'm going to say, okay, deliberate error down the bottom left. I've got some rock. So don't let that put you off because we can use something like the clone stamp tool. And uh, having watched my retouching videos, I'm just going to click a sample up the top and then just move directly down. And I can then move left and right. Look at that. Clicking, clicking, clicking. Now, deliberate error at number two, of course, is it ends up by... Um, what it ends up doing is, of course, copying uh, the same, I suppose, features. Um, and that creates, let me just finish here, that creates a thing I call step and repeat. All right, and you can see it's step, repeat, step, repeat. So the, so the same little features, little pimples, little dark spots, little light spots are repeated again and again and again. It looks like it's sort of the back end of a crocodile, doesn't it? Um, and that, you know, for a lot of people go, oh, that's pretty good. Uh, but if you're not aware of it, okay, so that, that could, it just looks like it's slipped or it's, it just looks a bit weird to me. So I need to get in there. And, you know, this is very typically the case, let's just go there, very typically the case if you don't have much room or much rock, for example, to clone. But, of course, we've got stacks of rock here, so I'm going to then just clone a random bit over here and stick it on top. I'm going to clone, clone a random bit over here, and I'm selecting it by just holding the Alt Option key down. This is a little bit trickier, but I'm just going to go and stick stuff. It could be from, you know, right on the other side of the gorge here, on the, other, the crack or the shadow here, and I could just do that. All right, and then I'm just going to do a little bit here, just to break up and get rid of that funny step and repeat, because as soon as you do that, it immediately looks a lot more believable. Trust me. Okay, trust me, I'm a journalist, as they say. Here we go. And I'm just going to do that. So I've been a little bit more careful. So you could, of course, just done that to begin with, but now I think you can agree that's a lot more convincing. You can't see any of the telltale apart from just on the left-hand side. So it might be just a bit tricky here and just paint that whole black thing out. There we go. There we go. Now, let's zoom back out. Bingo. So in a nutshell, how do we make panoramas? Number one is shoot in the manual metering mode. In this case, take a meter reading from the center of the picture, and that's your shot. Take a picture of your foot, and then go bang, bang, bang. You don't have to go from left to right or right to left. Either is good. Shoot your seven sections or your five sections. Overlap them by 20% or 25%, depending on your taste. Try and keep everything as on the level as possible. Turn the autofocus off. In this case, um, I focused in the mid-distance, so the autofocus might have latched onto the brush in the foreground on the right-hand side, you see. So as soon as it changes focus, the actual shape of the frame changes, and that makes it really, really hard for the poor old software to actually stitch them together, apart from the fact that it may go out of focus. So manual metering, autofocus off, set your white balance to custom, and set whatever the daylight temperature is. That's 6,500 degrees Kelvin. Do a little bit of testing. Months later, when you think, gee, I did actually do a panorama in that national park, where is it? You look for the two pictures in between your feet or to the two blank frames, because when you're looking out here, you're thinking, I just can't see. Where is it? You know, it is quite hard, so of course it's there. Uh, and I only did this a couple of weeks ago, so I remember where it is. But, you know, I sometimes come back to panoramas that I've shot years ago and I think, gee, I completely forgot about it. Let's go and try it. And so if you've got like an out-of-focus picture of your camera bag, you know that's the start point. So it's a very good way of sectionalizing your work. When you finally finish, we can, of course, put an overlay on this using one of these adjustment layers. So I could add a gradient to darken it down. I could add levels to change it, or I could just use hue saturation to increase, you know, the increase, the saturation, the veracity of the color here. And as you can see, it just sits on top of that layer. I can turn it off or turn it on every time I like, any time I like, in order to just play around uh, with the intensity. I can go back and, of course, make a mask out of this, and I'll look at that in a separate uh, tutorial, or I can go back and just choose hue and saturation and apply more, or a bit less, Robin, a bit less, something like that. And that, very simply, is how we work with the photo merge panorama function.